I'm, I'm really passionate about Fowler community because it, it's actually a result of, of a very long lifetime with a, with a whole string of experiences. But it's an attempt actually to use modern technology to try and make a change in our quality of life. And then uh, bridging over the political aspect and, and, and getting to a higher level of perception actually of a, a, a real quality of life. We're here at, uh, this morning at, at uh, Buscavanon, which is uh, one of the most magical stone circles in, in the West Penrith. This has led me all over the world to look into the knowledge of the ancient people, the kind of people who put this thing up. Their life was, was so much more honest and so much more simple than ours. In the same way as the old Waitaha in New Zealand, they, they were deeply concerned with each other. They cared for each other and they were in harmony with, the, with nature. They recognised that there was something way beyond their five centuries. I'd really like you to, to join in sharing some of the experiences I've had in my lifetime. Bear with me, because some sceptics might think are a bit outrageous, but, but they actually happened to me. And I'd love you to come with me to, to uh, just to, to understand why I feel the way I feel. I'm Hamish, I'm a, I'm a blacksmith, I'm a, a metal sculptor, I do a bit of writing, I work with trees and I work with the land and I work with healing the land and uh, that sounds a bit funny but I do heal land and people as well. I live here in Cornwall with my wife Bar. And we have uh, 12 acres of most wonderful woodland, which takes quite a lot of looking after. And thank goodness, Bar does most of the work. I really wanted to set up Fowler Community because of a whole series of events that happened, um, leading towards a, an enormous dissatisfaction with the way the world was, was uh, going on at the moment, the people who were making the, 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 the major decisions and uh, the whole business about this incessant business of going to war for any reason at all. And um, I set it up because I think I was inspired by Buckminster Fuller who said you can't actually tilt at well-established systems and, and the only way to get around them was to provide an alternative which was better and the only way I could think of doing that was to set up an, a new community were aware of the people around them and cared for them and looked after them and were uh, independent from the whole national systems of providing food and electricity and things like that. And it seems to be a, a, a huge step, but it's the only logical one that I can see that was going to work. And I set up Polar Community because if enough people get together, they have a loud enough voice to make themselves heard. You know, when I talked about the whole project, there were so many people who agreed entirely and they said, yeah, we agree with you, that these, these are terrific problems, but what can I do? And I wanted to, to, to answer that one, and the only answer to me is something like Powell Community. But it's not I, it's us. What can we do? Can we take our power back? Can we make our own decisions? Can we become independent? Can we be without fear? And will my grandchildren come to me and say, OK, you did try and do something at least, because you knew there was something wrong. Like everybody else, I was in the rat race for a long time, and I had a factory and, and 100 people, and, and my world was uh, the survival in the factory and the making stuff and selling it and doing all the things that one does and the total involvement. I just accepted that, that the work ethic was the big thing and, and, uh, and I can understand how people get absolutely trapped into that because you believe it's the most important thing in the world and in fact it's not. There are values that, that uh, 
are much, much, much more important than just surviving the economic battle. I suppose I'm one of the lucky ones because uh, I was seriously involved in the, in the whole commercial game of, of, of earning a living and, and looking after kids and coping with a mortgage and all that sort of thing. But I was, I was lucky in that I have had some extraordinary, really extraordinary experiences in my lifetime that, that uh, are way beyond the normal of people's living. And I have to admit that when I was running the factory, I had no idea. And if I'd heard myself speaking then, um, I would have said, you've, you've, you've flipped, you've fall off your trolley or whatever. But now I'm, I'm desperately trying to imply that there is a, a set of values which is infinitely more valuable than the commercial ones. That there, is, there are spiritual values, and as soon as you say spiritual, it's, people think it's a religious thing. It's not, it's nothing to do with that. It's, a, it's, an, uh, it's a moving into an understanding of, of why we're here and our relationship with the earth and the cosmos and with, with particularly with our neighbours, our friends and neighbours and, and we've lost this whole business of being in community. There was a time when the old grandmothers and, and would, would look after the kids and, and it would be a, like a much wider family that, that, uh, uh, in, in their way of living. But nowadays we have, we have nothing to pull us together cohesively. Community to me is quite simply caring. It's about caring for people who are less capable of, of coping with life than you are. And that, a lot of that we've completely lost in this tremendous battle we have just to survive. Well, the, the, the business developed, it's, it's, it's one of these inevitable things that anybody in business knows about. I mean, we started off with 10 people and then uh, it, it began to get difficult for me to find enough work for 10 people. So I decided we need a rep. And once you need a rep, you go from 10 people to 25 people because you've got to pay for the rep and all that, that, that system that keeps going up. And then we, we developed and eventually I, I, we were employing 100 people. It started off as an, an engineering project and, and I loved working with steel and iron and things like that. And it was in a little cow shed. And the development from the cow shed to a factory employing 100 people was immensely satisfying. But at that time, it left me with absolutely no margin for, for anything else in my life at all. It became a sort of nightmare on this train you couldn't get off. And that, this is the situation, I see people in it all the time. And I, I really would like to, to introduce them to the fact that it, it is not 100% um, virtuous to just work. A hundred people is a big mouth to feed in, in furniture manufacturing. You have to have you know, regular contracts, and we did that. We were getting accolades and done write-ups for export all over the country. We had our furniture in every embassy in the in the world, practically, and it was it was going very successfully. I realised eventually, after a while, that, that I, I wasn't doing the design work that I enjoyed. It was frantic stuff to try and cope with with or, or, or get work in, and there was there was no joy about it at all. And I, and I eventually felt I was just a sort of wet nurse for a hundred people and, and dealt with all their, their problems. I felt that there was, there was a dimension missing and at that time I, I didn't know what I know now. We worked with the Japanese and Mitsubishi and people like that and um, one of the cathartic things that happened is a very small thing like, like pushing a switch. I'd had a, a, a long hard day and I was about two miles from the house and I looked over and there was a beautiful red gold sunset and on the crest of the edge of the field these black oak trees with their branches all there and I thought god that's so beautiful I wish I had time to look at it and something clicked inside what are you talking about you have got time stop the car which I did and I sat there not in the car I went over to the fence and leaned on this fence and I watched the sun go down and it was a cathartic moment because it was probably the turning point of, of realising that what I was doing wasn't what I wanted to do. And then I think it was a month later I was coming down the track to do the same sort of thing again, to go up to London to talk about some furniture and, and all that sort of thing. Beautiful morning and I had, I had a very old 14th century house, drive down, five acres of land in Sussex. And I had a gardener who used to come part time. And as I was coming down, this gardener came in his battered old van and he pulled onto the grass. And he, as I passed, tearing up to London, he looked out and he just grinned at me and shook his head. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
And I thought, God, you've got it right. You are going to spend this beautiful day in this beautiful place in Sussex. And I, in order to employ you, are going up to London. And that was another cathartic moment. I said, this, I've got it completely wrong. That, that started the whole business of, of the realisation that the race was not worth a candle, that the money behind it was not worth a candle. It was the, the communication with people and nature that was really worthwhile. And that was, that was a significant uh, uh, turn in my, my whole life. We were working on the top end of the market, and on the top end of the furniture market, is the, the competition is totally global. And, and it, the stress of, of doing that is, is quite enormous. And then there was uh, a little bit of a turn down with the uh, recession of the late, late 70s, which was very difficult to write. And one of my, uh, one of my directors died and I said, I'll just take over what, he, what he's doing because we really can't afford to get somebody else in in this thing. And the other one, the financial one, went out to New Zealand. And uh, right in the middle of all of that, um, I was taken suddenly ill on one Thursday evening. Found myself whisked to the hospital on the Friday and was operated on the Saturday. And um, in the middle of the operation, I died. I had an out-of-the-body experience which profoundly changed my thinking on absolutely everything because um, it, it, it is a unique experience. You don't have to go through it to get through into a, a stage of understanding uh, what we're talking about, but, but it helps. And it, to me, I was so rigidly into the disciplines of manufacture that I hadn't really had time to think about other things. And it profoundly changed my thinking. I just, I, I had to, to wipe out the, the, the company actually just, just was taken out by the bank. And I retreated to Cornwall. This hill at the back here has always drawn me. It's drawn me for years. And um, I had to find a way of living. Now I had been working on every Wednesday evening, being taught blacksmithing by my works director. So when I, when I came down here, I said, what am I going to be? Because when I was... Actually, when I was six years old, my mother asked me what I wanted to be, and, and I said, I want to be a blacksmith. And she said, no, 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 you must get a proper job. And I said, well, what is a proper job? And she said, a doctor or a dentist or a, or a lawyer or a civil servant. And I said, what does a civil servant do? She said, I don't know, but it's a proper job. <laughs> anyway, I, I, after 53 years, I, I thought when I came down here, I will earn a living as a blacksmith and uh, I have never regretted a moment of, of giving up the manufacturing bit, giving up the, the big money side. Actually it's a very huge advantage for me now to have been in a position at one time of making a lot of money because I recognise the real value of that, which is very little indeed. I came back here after I, I had my near-death experience and I, I found this hugely restful, magical place. The view all the way around, I think it's one of the finest views in Europe and it's, it's incredibly peaceful. I was going along very happily with the, the whole factory thing and it working and, and all that sort of thing and then I became ill. I had uh, a long chat with a surgeon and his two assistants who had a look at me and said, uh, there is something seriously wrong with your inside, we can't find out what it is, we'll have to go in and operate. And then I had uh, a long uh, a chat with an, an Irish night sister who was absolutely wonderful and just talked to me about death and nobody had done that before. And she was so incredibly matter of fact and, and assessed my chances, maybe 50-50 maybe it would be. And she was absolutely lovely and, and uh, we talked long into the night about what was going to happen and, and all that. And the next thing I knew I was down in the, in the I, I suppose it must have been the, the chap we did the anaesthetic. And I was at pains to tell him I was 12 stone and would he please give me enough <laughs> of his medicine. Anyway, the next thing I knew was waking up on the, on the operating table. And I looked up and the surgeon and the, his two assistants that I'd been talking to, turned, the, the, main, the surgeon turned to his assistant and says, pity you were too late chaps. And I thought, that's odd, because I had all my senses. And I suddenly realised I wasn't seeing him from the operating table, I was seeing him from the 
from up top. And it was extraordinary to look down and see me lying in the, on the table. And there was, I had absolutely no fear, no, no, it, very strange. So I was really seriously interested in, in what was happening. No fear at all. And then um, I saw the nurses clearing up the place and, and starting to switch the lights out. And the next thing was that I seemed to go further up and into a thick mist. And again, there was no fear. It was total peace, total calm, total acceptance, a little tinge of regret at leaving the body that had been so good to me for so long. And then gradually the mist formed into a, a, a tunnel. And my tunnel was, was a great long thing with, with aluminium sheets and, and sort of peach light behind the, each sheet going back and back and back and back. And I wasn't me, I was in a, I was a, a long aluminium tube with rounded ends and a, in a place of total peace, total, no coercion to do anything, absolute compassion, total understanding. And then I became aware of a, a, a vague light at the end of the tunnel. As soon as my mind was aware of that, uh, the tube started to travel very slowly along the tunnel. And when it got to the end, it stopped. And then I came out of it as a, a babe about three years old, probably. And uh, probably a nappy on, if you like. And it, it was just an expression of total innocence, really. And I remember there was no fear at all. I remember seeing this, this area in front of me, which I can only describe as like, like Carrara marble floor. And no people and no, no buildings and no nothing like I'd ever seen, sort of misty forms that were vaguely architectural. And then the, the beings, I was aware of beings, but I couldn't see them or anything, but they were there and their minds were totally compassionate, total understanding of how I felt. And I was, t it, was it was extraordinary because I, I, I didn't, didn't, I wasn't in the least bit afraid. I was curious um, and I really wanted to know what, what was happening. And I was aware of the voices saying, this is, uh, and this is where the language, I haven't got the proper language for this. This is the entrance to where we are. That's the nearest thing I can, I can get. These are some of our concepts. And if you can contribute to these concepts, or if you can even understand them, you're very welcome to come in and join us. And I was given the idea, and I can't even tell you what the concepts were. I mean, it was to do with the color of music and all sorts of things that, that are way beyond our five senses, really. And they said, you've got all your, the experience of all of your lifetimes here. You've got all the time in the universe to make up your mind. And I looked at some of these concepts and, and, and I thought, I don't even understand. And I th it said, if you like, I think, um, I think I ought to go back. And there was a universal chortle, not of laughing at me, but laughing with me. And they said, we think you should. <laughs> so I got into the, into the tube again and started hurtling down the tunnel. And I was aware that at the other end, I could only describe there was great shards of glass, broken glass at the end. And I thought, I'm going to come back into a great deal of pain. But in the event, I went hurtling through these things without any effect at all. And the next thing I remember was um, somebody tapping on my skull and saying, is there anyone in there, Mr. Miller? And I was, I was desperate to tell them about the great joy that I'd had in my journey up to the other place. And uh, I, mean, I couldn't because I was just, I was absolutely asleep. And, and it, was, it was an extraordinary experience. And, and I came back with, with a total, totally different set of values. I had, had every sense was, was, uh, was, tweaked up a degree, if you like, and everything I touched, and everything I heard, everything I saw um, was, was as I had never seen it before or never heard it before. And I was also totally aware of the energy of everything and the connection between everything. I could almost see the, 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 the joins, if you like, of, of the energy line. But I'm not suggesting for a moment that you have to go through the death experience to, 
to, to have your perceptions uh, moved up to another level because there are people, quite perfectly, uh, millions of perfectly normal people whose perceptions are at that level already. So I'm not claiming to be anything unique at all. It's just that I'm, I'm more sensitive, I think, to, to earth energy, which I've been specialising in for the last 25 years, than I, certainly than I was before. I decided at that time that I did not want to go on with the life I'd had before because I could see all the things wrong with it. And I came down to, to uh, Cornwall down here and, and sat up here and recuperated in remarkable time. The implication is that, okay, yes, there are other realities going on at the same time as we are existing here. According to the scientific world, the, the other realities do exist. I mean, the latest stuff on, on uh, quantum physics is, is almost a proof that, that other realities do exist. Uh, these scientists at one time would, wouldn't have, have, have listened to experiences which implied some sort of other sense or a spiritual sense, if you like. But now, of course, they're intent on finding what human consciousness is and what our real relationship to it and what is reality, what, what, what is our relationship with the cosmos. And they are the people who are beginning to be supportive about these sort of experiences. The trouble is that, that their findings and, and my findings you know, are not getting out to mainstream and there are millions of people who just dismiss these things. Oh, no, 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 it's an absolute nonsense. All I ask you to do is to consider the possibility that they could be true. Don't dismiss it. Just think about it. I'm making some dowsing rods here because I'm quite into dowsing and these are rods that I'm making for particular people because I've taken an outline of their hand and I make them to fit the hand. Dowsing is, is, is one of the doorways into finding an extra sense of some kind. This is the, the sacred site of Bus coming on. And it's the place where I really started to learn about earth energy. It is extremely complex and these old people knew more about it than I will ever know. Very difficult to describe what, what earth energy is. Anything that you, you, you try and put in a pigeonhole, you're oversimplifying. This is a very, very complex structure. It's a combination of the Earth's nervous system and its meridians. It's exactly the same sort of system as we have. And scientists, of course, have measured the difference of the energy inside the circle and outside, and it's quite, it is measurable. So there is a difference. So earth energy does exist. And uh, it's, it's not something we, we're having to, to prove now. It's, it's something we have to probably improve the instrumentation to measure it. The Japanese are, are really seriously developing, trying to develop some sort of electronic system because they realize the importance of the profound effect that Earth energy has on our, on our being. There's something, uh, there's something old and ancestral about blacksmithing that I've disco I discovered the, the art really after I'd been through the the whole commercial rat race. So I came in here about 25 years ago and, and, and made the first dowsing rod. It was incredible because I'd, I'd just been to a talk with somebody who, who was a consummate dowser, old Colin Bloy, who started the Fountain International. I went to him and I asked him to point me towards a dowser in, in Cornwall. Um, and he said, because I wanted to work on, on earth energy, he introduced me to earth energy. And he said, do it yourself. And I thought, I felt totally rejected. I thought he'd shut the door on me, but, but he, he hadn't actually, because six months later I knocked out the dowsing rod I use now, actually. I hammered out this rod and, and, and with some anger, actually, at, still at Colin Bly for... for <laughs> and I thought, well, you know, all right, I'll, I'll do that. And uh, I used this and I walked up the road between my house and the hill at the back. And and um, crossed the line between the hill and St. Michael's Mount. And I said, is there any earth energy flowing between 
the hill and St Michael's Mount. And I got just that, that little flicker, but it was doing it on its own. And that totally changed my life. And in 25 years, I'm still learning. And as soon as you think you know something about the Earth's field and it, the way its energy reacts, you discover a whole new path. It's a totally living being and it's got moods like we all have. The line actually goes through the forge. In fact, that, uh, I have to say, is why I've got the forge there, because it's right smack in the middle of the, the Athena energy, and it's very, very strong, uh, creative female energy, and it's a great place to work. A anybody in the world can find an energy line, if they acknowledge that it's there to start with, and if they realise its existence, then the, this, the, uh, a Dajin rod will show it up, provided they reach the level of concentration you need to be sure that that's what you're finding. And what you have to do when you're looking for an energy line is absolute total concentration on exactly what you're looking for. This is the difficult bit. Absolute total concentration. You've got to cut out everything else in the world. So show me where the, the nearest edge of this energy line is. Now that's the nearest edge. And you go to the search position again and you ask for the centre of the line because you want to find the width. And the rods register where the centre of the line is, which is that way. As soon as they're parallel. And you put them to the search position again and you ask for the outside edge. The far edge. Now this is quite a wide line actually. It doesn't matter what you're dosing for, as long as you're, you are totally concentrated on finding that and, that and nothing else. And that's the, that's the difficult bit with, with dowsing. The degree of concentration we need is much higher than anything else we do in our normal lives. All Earth energy is benign. Sometimes there are some uncomfortable bits, and some, but they have been influenced by, by people's consciousness here rather than... Uh, there's, there's nothing evil or satanic about Earth energy at all. Um, but sometimes, of course, because these lines are made up of, of lots and lots of different frequencies, sometimes there is a frequency that's uncomfortable. And people uh, very often get in touch with us and say, is there anything you can do about this because I can't go into that room? We have a fairly close relationship with the management. We don't decide what should happen. All we do is point out that somebody is uncomfortable with that particular frequency of earth energy and please can they do something about it and 99.9 .9 times out of 100 they will say yes fine we can sort it out but we'll sort it out in a way that won't harm anybody else usually when we when we are called out i take uh, bar along because she actually is as a female is sensitive to things that don't register with me sometimes of course there are there are entities if you like uh, which are just us trapped in a, in a different time this was, was an important one because as a five-year-old child who had got to the stage where they were being deeply disturbed by an entity who was making noises with her, her toys. When we first moved in, um, I didn't notice there was a problem, but my little girl started saying a few things like, for instance, what's that man doing behind you, mummy? And with the stairs here, when we used to walk up the stairs, she'd stop halfway and say, stand back and let somebody pass. So I thought it was a little game. But as the months went on, I started to hear things. This is Saskia's bedroom, and this is the mobile, which is the first thing I heard that I couldn't explain. Um, I was in bed reading, and I heard this noise, which is quite, maybe a little louder than that. As somebody had brushed past it, so I assumed Saskia's on her way into the bedroom. Um, she didn't turn up, so I came to check on she's fast asleep. Um, so the next day I decided to come up here and jiggle the bed about, lay on the bed and see if it would create the same noise. And when I, well, I couldn't explain this, I literally sat on the bed and thought, something's not right here, there's something going on. I was reading her a story one night and she said, it's much too scary for me to sleep in here now. And I said, what do you mean? She said, there's, someone comes in my room at night, I can hear them walking around. So I tried to say maybe it was the birds on the roof or mummy coming to check you. She said, no, I'm on my own and I know there's somebody here because I can hear them breathing. 
and they wake me up and I don't like it and I'm very frightened. On the landing outside here, because it's a wooden floor, we could hear footsteps um, going between my room and Saskia's room. Um, sort of almost sounded like they were running sometimes. Um, and in her bedroom here, because I had the baby monitor on, I could hear her little toys being played with. If I'd heard something, I would come in and peek through the door and she'd be fast asleep. It started to really frighten me. I didn't want to be in the house in the evening on, on my own. Hamish said he would come and have a look round for us. All these things are energy forms. They have no particular material existence here. They can exist anywhere at all. The big point about these is they are desperately lonely. They're just us at a slightly different level. They're lost. They're desperately lonely. They've nobody to talk to at all. And what they try and do is summon off enough energy to impinge on one of our five senses. And they will do anything just to say, for God's sake, I'm here, will somebody help? So once you've located them in this thing, there is a way of communicating with them to help them to realise where they are and to realise that their absolute ambition to get out of here and back to the, the, the sort of uh, life where they could be at the next level. They often go off without even saying goodbye which is, is slightly worrying because you've gone to all this effort and suddenly whoosh, they've gone. And the, the people in the house, of course, suddenly realise that, that they have gone. There is a fundamental difference in the house. There's no reason for fear anyway. There, there wasn't before. But people are concerned, obviously, about bumps in the night and things like that. When he came down and said that they had found somebody, it was, it was a big relief, actually. It was quite... I felt quite emotional knowing that there had been somebody here, obviously trying to get help. Um, but from then onwards, it was, felt a lot more peaceful upstairs. It's like a different place, all thanks to him. Happy house. There was a case of the Mount Haven Hotel where, where there was a great deal of disturbance about, and with, with one of the, the energies, and people were feeling ill and depressed and uh, it was having a, a serious effect on their whole way of living. We bought the hotel uh, because of its fantastic views. It dates back to 1840 and it had, there's a lot of history and there's a lot of human footprint there and the, the energy wasn't that clean. You know, in places, you know, being, being quite sensitive, you know, I'd actually feel physically sick in some areas and although I'm not psychic, even I could see different sort of discarnate figures like shadows wandering about and guests would often sort of ask me in the mornings it, were, were their rooms haunted bless him hamish came and did an awful lot of work for me helped clear the energy lines where they were really thick and sick and um, also did some rescue medium work and and now you know people you know, so many people now comment on, on how wonderful the energy is here and that's because it's been cleared and the energy that was naturally here is just so beautiful. But until Hamish cleared it, we, we really couldn't enjoy it. I don't think we would get the amount of repeat business that we get and so much of our business is repeat business and, you know, it, it's because of the way it makes people feel, the sense of peace and relaxation that's available there now. See, Hamish, Hamish has got some hotline to hire management and don't ask me how he does it, but bless him, he does it beautifully. Most times um, we find it's just a, a discomfort caused by to the, to the whoever is living in the house by one particular frequency of energy. And we just ask the management to change the frequency from a disturbing one to a healing one. So we do a double whammy and they feel so much better. We live in a beautiful bungalow, but it never felt comfortable. I had permanent headaches. I felt depressed. I could never lift myself out of this depression. But once Hamish had cleared it, then the whole vibration changed. I felt joy afterwards. I felt totally elated. When I was working with um, other people outside around to trying to help them with their energy problems, I realised that, that I had still an awful lot to learn. And I was experimenting uh, in this room, actually. And during the experiment, I found that there was a, a little energy centre here. There's an absolute basic form of an energy centre in that it has, a, it has a spiral, a vortex coming out of it. And always there are straight radials of energy coming out of it. And I found 
But the total count was 14. Everybody can be involved in this because everybody has a, an energy center of that, this sort of kind, either a strong one or a weaker one, in their own room. It seems to respond to their consciousness. If you start working with it and just acknowledge it, like you would acknowledge your dog or your cat or something like that and stroke it and just say hi. It's not a po-face thing to do, just say hi and acknowledge the fact that there is a pulsing energy center, a, a, a live energy center here. It will respond to your thoughts. You must understand that the earth has a consciousness and it reacts to our consciousness. And the simplest way to find out how it responds is to periodically count the radials coming out of it. You see, even while we've been filming here, we've been putting our attention on this little spot and recognizing it, and that's all it needs. It starts responding right away. So it'd be worth, we started with 14 radials when the, when the, the, sh the shooting started. So I'll just uh, have a check and see how many there are now. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. Hello. <laughs> it still sends shivers down my spine. The implication behind a change like that, because three of us have been thinking about it, just consider the enormous implications behind the fact that you can communicate or your consciousness can communicate with something live that's pulsing on the earth. Very shortly, St. Michael's Mount will come into view, and my, St. Michael's Mount is an extremely important part of my life, right from the, 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 the initial stages of coming to Cornwall, and has continued to be because it was instrumental in starting off the research on the Michael line, which goes from, we now understand, it goes from Carnley Ball and comes through St. Michael's Mount and goes right across the country for 300 miles. And I became uh, really interested in, in what happened to the Michael line and, and joined up with uh, Paul Broadhurst to write the book called Sun and the Serpent. And this was the initiation to come over here and, and steep ourselves in the energy here. I was able to tune in to the particular band of frequencies that is the Michael line and practiced in, in, in finding them by being driven in the dark in a, in a van so that I couldn't see where we were. So I could tune in and pick up these energies absolutely anywhere in any weather conditions. And that, I, I spent six months doing that before we even started doing the research at all. So Michael's Mines, it's, it's such a stimulating place. There's a recorded story now. It's, it's the third or fourth century BC. And it was at night and there were four fishermen at the high tide rowing back across. And they suddenly, one of them looked up in the front there. And he was astonished to see this, this bright, bright light right on the, on the, on the end of the, the island on the right hand side there. And they thought, of course, at that time it was the a manifestation of the Archangel of St. Michael. And I think the uh, facts behind it are that the, the, at that point, there are four major energy lines meeting and they are all different frequencies. They can live together quite well, but I think just at that moment, they probably got in sync. And the impact of the vortex of energy there uh, affected their eyesight, if you like, their vision. And they saw it as this great big bright light. It was a vortex of energy. Very, very few places in the world there are major, major pairs of energy lines meet. And where they meet are 
really sacred places, very special places indeed, and they have a profound effect on all our biomagnetic fields around us. And all of us feel the difference. People come over here, they walk across the, the causeway here, and they go up there and they come back from St. Michael's Mount feeling absolutely great. And it's because they're all there. Uh, energy fields around them, the biomagnetic fields, are all caressed and beautifully balanced. And it, that's why it's so important that we must find out about Earth energy, because it does affect our behaviour enormously. The right-hand side there, just behind that, there's a flat platform just behind the little V-notch. And we found a PowerPoint which is exactly the same as the one we found in the cottage. So the center of the power point, we, we does the center of the energy, and we found this amazing, almost true, this, this is not true, but Fibonacci spiral. Difficult for me to do it accurately. Spirals are notoriously difficult to draw, but from there, and from the center, there were these radials coming out in exactly the same way. And it was very difficult to, to count these because it, the, the whole thing was pulsing, it was so powerful. And as, as soon as we started observing it, I did a count of these things. It was quite difficult actually, it's a very narrow platform. And I kept uh, going around and, and, and trying to get the number and, and, and it, there's a 50 foot drop into the sea. And of course you forget when you're, you're watching this rod. <laughs> and uh, it was pulsing so much, it was very difficult to get an accurate count because as soon as you started to, to consciously acknowledge that there was a power point there, it started to vary and this, this spiral started to tighten up. But it's certainly one of the most powerful energy centers in, in the UK. My mentor was Colin Boyd, and he was the man that taught me to doubt. And he taught me about earth energy, and he taught me about how he was interpreting a way of altering uh, the uh, people's behavior, actually, uh, by getting a group of people to communicate with the earth. And the, the response from the earth had a, an effect on all the people living around. And he did it, actually, when the mods and rockets came down to Brighton, and he started a thing called the Fountain round about the fountain, that's why it's called the Fountain International. And he had a hundred people around just, just pouring uh, sort of good wishes and, and benevolence and calm into this area. And it had a profound effect on the way the, the mods and rockets, they, they were chucking stuff through shop windows before, and then they ended up exchanging helmets with policemen. And, and, and I mean, there was a huge difference, a measurable difference. The, the thing about the uh, uh, Son of the Serpent was, I, I mean, it all started here. Uh, we were absolutely inspired by the St. Michael's Mount. It was three years worth of work to, to follow, um, well, 18 months of work to follow the Michael line, and then the realization in the middle of the whole thing in Avonbury that we, there was another line. There was, a, there was a balance, there was a female balance, and, and nature needs a female balance. We should have known. It's there, an almost circular stone here, and the energy point is just to the right of that on the platform. And it, it, where, this is where the Apollo and Athena and the Michael and Mary actually meet at that point. The Earth has made a, a mathematical manifestation at this point, which is quite extraordinary. It took three years to develop. And it's now uh, four absolutely perfect 12-pointed uh, stars. Now, it progressively changed all the way up each time the Michael and Mary crossed. And when we started to check, as it changed, every point on the Michael and Mary changed its manifestation at the same time, which implies some sort of communication, some sort of intelligence coming down this, this earth energy. The energy on the Michael line was weaving a line like a river, and it's a natural thing for earth energy to do. The whole joy of, of the, the, uh, the story and the three-year search developed from this point here. John Michel had uh, dug up some information uh, by the Rishi brothers in France about another lineup which included St. Michael's Mount and St. Michael's Kelleg in Ireland and came right up from, from Greece, right through Europe. The line through Europe was two and a half thousand miles long. England was, was 300 miles long. 
and we thought there must be much more to learn, which in fact there was, and it took us 10 years to, to uh, do this, this incredible journey down following the two lines actually that come across the bay here and cross at that point there. The manifestations again on the crossing points changed from uh, the, the original simple one on the St. Michael Skelly. It finally ended up with a sort of almost like a Rosicrucian sign, most extraordinary. The Apollo line came into the Apollo Temple of Apollo in Delphi and it made a great loop round the stone, the Sibyl stone, where the oracle used to be. So obviously there was a distortion of the energy and that could affect people. The scientists are recognising the importance of human consciousness and how it affects everything. I, I think that, that people underestimate the, the influence that we have, our consciousness have on, on the earth. Our blacksmithing main, means, a, it means a great deal to me because, well, first of all, it's about earning a living. But the other thing is that with the other work that I do, it's, it's working with fire, air, earth and water. And I think you have to be really brought down in close contact with the earth when you're, when you're working with the, this sort of stuff, you're working with earth energies and working with all that, that sort of thing. But these, these journeys around the world were, were uh, I mean, it was over the years, actually, and they, they, were, they were incredibly draining. I was under a huge stress to get the dowsing right because we were always up against time and money. So these two things made us have to brush from one place to the other. And of course we didn't know where we were going until we found it by dowsing. So we had no positive plan about where we were going to be or where we were going to go. And time after time we would, we would, we'd have disciplined uh, two weeks or three weeks or something like that. And we'd come back having travelled almost thousands of miles, absolutely exhausted. And people would come along and say, oh yeah, have you been another holiday then? <laughs> <laughs> and I used to think, oh my God, you know, what a holiday. <laughs> so it was so important to have this at the end of the journey, you know, the, the, the pure business of blacksmithing, this grounding uh, of, of fire, air, earth and water. I developed a whole group of, of, of uh, customers, if you like, of potential customers or friends, who started giving me really, really um, uh, very interesting commissions for sculptures. There was one particular sculpture in Penzance, which was great actually. It was a celebration of, of, of completing a garden. And it's called uh, Coming Home. Tony and I, I think we saw Cornwall coming back as returning to our Avalon. And what Hamish has done for us here is to give, give us something which gives me an extraordinary sense of joy. It's fun, it's moving, but it's so meaningful. I just wanted to include the wee gate. <laughs> I'm very proud of it. It earned our last visit to New Zealand, where we finally met the Waitaha, who started the whole thing about Powell community. The reason we went to, to uh, New Zealand to work with the energies there was, was quite simple, because the Son of the Serpent took us three years to do it across Aitland. It took ten years for the manifestations to change in the Dance of the Dragon. And I thought, well, surely I can find someone in the world for these manifestations will change faster. But it was only when we got to New Zealand, we suddenly realised that, that in, in the first visit, that these manifestations were, 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 were very complex and very profound, and there was an understanding of them from the Maori based on the and the, the knowledge of the ancient people, the ancient Waitaha, and their culture of 2,000 years ago, and we learned so much from that so quickly. The earth is, is, is really, um, she, she is so benign and she's so kind to us, but I think that she's try, she really is trying to communicate with us by doing these manifestations, because there's no other reason to do it. This is a form of communication. And the basic form of uh, communication must be mathematical between two such diverse species. It's the only way they can't communicate. While I was there, of course, I, I, I had some really very, very profound experiences indeed, uh, which, which actually probably uh, had the same effect as a near-death experience. And in fact, it was a very close to a near-death, another near-death experience. But it, it had a different form because there the, the were the, the white ancestors in the background of this thing. 
and I hadn't realised just the immense power that their minds have. Waita Howe were a race that, that uh, came from various different parts of the world, actually. They had, uh, uh, they had schools of learning which, which uh, we don't begin to understand because they've taught them a degree of concentration that we can't conceive of now because we can't achieve that sort of, of, of level of concentration. The thing is that these, these people lived for a thousand years in total harmony with each other and with the earth. And they wasted absolutely nothing and they had a, a, a huge regard for, for every living form of, of uh, life on the island and for each other because they were, they were a completely mixed race different ethnic groups and they were in total harmony and they had no perception after a thousand years of war and they were capable of making decisions the leaders who made the decisions which were compassionate and fair for everybody i feel incredibly privileged to have been involved with the white heart the ancestors of the white heart the people the descendants of the white heart because of their way of living it was honest it was pure it was it was absolutely uh, in tune and in harmony with everything in nature and the cosmos and I think we've got a great deal to learn from them. I've been really uh, very lucky because I've been able to go all around the world looking at sacred sites. But of course every time I come back to Cornwall I'm, I'm absolutely delighted and, and, and so happy to be back here because it's, it has a magic all of its own and it has its, sacred, its own sacred sites. But one of the one of the most powerful and the one the one that affected me profoundly was the one in Castle Hill in, in South Island in New Zealand. It's a huge site and, and right in the middle of it there is a marae which is, is uh, related to the sacred Punamu stone where they used to collect the Punamu and, and uh, the women looked after this particular marae and it, that usually had a, a, a water filled basin in it. By the time we got there it had a dry season, it's all dried up and it was a sort of sandy base, a dusty base with, with rocks on it. And I started for, uh, dozing for the power centre and it had an extra five big energy lines which come in from different directions. I mean, there were, there were bands of that sort of relative size and they were meeting here at that point. Now normally, when you have something like that, you have some sort of manifestation at the point which is an addition to the spiral and all the radials. And I went very confidently towards this thing because I thought, here we have one of the major sacred sites in New Zealand. Nothing, absolutely nothing. And I tried and I tried with, with every level of dowsing that I've got to try and find this thing because I felt that I was being the one who was inadequate and I wasn't being able to pick up the subtleties of what was happening in this site. And I was really seriously disappointed because I, I had a feeling that this place would be of some absolutely paramount importance in the work I've been doing. So in, in absolute despair, I just marked the place with a little stone. I felt totally inadequate, but I, I, I marked it because I, I still had the feeling that there was going to be, there was something that was going to happen here. It's an important place. Amazing feeling of the whole massive great stones around and, and the magic of, of uh, ancient people and, and just a feeling, big feeling and then I had to walk away. I went back to this site the next day because I, I knew there was, and I was actually with a group of people and the group included a, an amazing Maori girl who said very, very little at all, but she'd been with this party and they were visiting sacred sites um, all around New Zealand and this, they happened to be visiting on this particular day. And I was sitting down at the, the, the edge of the, the site there and she was sitting a bit further along, she didn't say anything at all. And she suddenly got up and she had a backpack and out of her backpack she took this enormous great uh, Punamu stone. This is, this is Punamu, the green stone, the, the peace stone. It's a magical, it's a, it's a jade type thing. It was much, much bigger than that, the one she had. And she, she suddenly started to walk in. Of course, the, I... I, the, I there was no marking on, on where, and my stone was one of a thousand stones in the middle of this place. I suddenly was aware of it, uh, getting this Punamu stone out, and walking very carefully into the centre of this marae. And she, and she hadn't been there. Nobody had seen me dowsing. And she kicked the stone away, with great ceremony, laid the stone down on that point, and then stood back, 
and she raised her head and there was almost a complete metamorphosis. She was, she was sort of hand-shouldered and, and suddenly became almost balletic and started singing to the earth. And then she looked up and, and she beckoned because Bar and, and two or three other girls were there and they all sang again to the, to the, to the earth. And it was a, it was a, ver a delightfully peaceful ceremony. And I had to go off uh, looking for a well somewhere else. And Bart told me about the, the detail of the end of the ceremony later in the evening. And I said, I must go back and see you know, if anything has, has, has happened to this place after this Maori girl had done the ceremony. So the following morning, uh, I went up and where I had had no indication of a manifestation whatsoever the day before, or two days before, there was suddenly the most beautiful thing in the middle of it, which had formed itself, right on that point. This thing did not exist the day before. This thing was a direct result of Donna, Maori, close to the earth, singing consciously, communicating with the power center in the earth. And it's this, this sort of manifestation that, that, that it's just so important that, that people realize that they, they do have a, a direct communication through the consciousness with the, with the planet. And they can affect profoundly the, the, the future of the planet and the communication with the planet and the care for the planet by their, their thought and their, their concern for its being. I didn't realize at the time that in this, in this place where Donna had her experience, I would have a cathartic experience later on. We had uh, several visits to New Zealand, but this, this last one, we had done an awful lot of preparation for uh, setting up talks and visits and research into various sacred sites. Something happened in Singapore, either I drank the water or something bit me because uh, we were supposed to three, stay three days with uh, some friends of mine in Sydney. And when I got off the plane, I felt really, really ropey. And I finally got to the stage there where, where um, I was whistled into intensive care in the hospital. And for five days, I was on a drip feed, not, not anything to eat. Couldn't put my foot to the floor, got convulsive hiccups. And um, it got to the stage with Bar where, where we had a, an earnest discussion about how the hell to get me home. And we came to the conclusion <laughs> A quick cremation was probably the right job, and uh, Bar could take me home in her in her uh, hand luggage on the rack. The thing is, in hospital, I had this amazing hallucination, I suppose, which lasted four consecutive nights, and the hospital changed into a laboratory with with uh, a great big glass rectangular tanks with coloured fluid in them. And there were benign people feeding nutrients into the glass tanks, which had sort of amoeba-like shapes, and I was one of them. I was aware at the back of my bed of two immense creatures chuntering to each other, very, very deep voices, and saying, it's all very well having to look after this creature, but it's made of very poor material. And I, I, got, I, I never actually saw them, but they were so familiar to me after five nights I made a little sketch of them in the hospital of these creatures as I thought they would have to be. And although I was quite seriously ill, I wasn't really too worried about it because I, I knew I was being looked after by these huge, immense, benign creatures behind my bed in the hospital. And although all the plans that I had were completely scuppered, I had no idea what a wonderful experience I was about to have in Castle Hill. See, the Waitaha are an ancient people with a very, very special way of relating to each other in the air. And their culture came down through the women who remembered everything in meticulous detail through songs. The culture of the Waitaha was, was perfect memory, perfect uh, recollection. 
all that sort of thing. And they had this degree of concentration that we don't begin to understand. So the concentration by the women on their, their songs and the detail of the song means that the, the, the detail of their culture came down through the songs with incredible accuracy. And they are such a shining example of what we could be. Going up to, to Castle Hill on the, at dawn on the last day, we knew that something important was going to happen. And we walked down with some difficulty, if you like, because my leg was still suffering from whatever had happened. And I asked the management if it was okay to sit down. And it was, you have to have these courtesies with the management and you can't take, ever take them for granted. So I asked if it was okay if I sat down. They said, no, it's fine. So I sat in the middle of this thing and I, I, I just relaxed into the whole energy of the place. and got deeper and deeper and deeper into it. And there was nobody else there. Ba was there, just observing. Absolutely quiet, beautiful morning. A really uh, numinous feeling about the place. And suddenly I became aware that I was being watched. And I resisted it because I, was, I, I didn't want anything to disturb this thing. And eventually I just couldn't, couldn't stop myself turning around and I looked around and absolute deep shock because I saw these two immense beings who had been behind my bed in the hospital. And through them, the, the ancient ancestors of the Waitaha came through with their concern and the, they came through as they had... The Waitaha had the, had the men of the stone and they, they were men of the stone. And a lot of the communication was mind to mind. And uh, they, they, they had a way of, of conveying an idea that, that, that is, is beyond telepathy. It's, it's, it's some, some way of mind to mind communication that goes beyond language. But it was couched in terms that I have to, I have to almost marginalised to try and get the whole essence of the, the message through. But their message was very, very loud and clear that they were deeply concerned about the state of the earth at the moment, particularly about the way we're choosing our leaders. Because their leaders were born in the right place, at the right time, under the right stars, with generations of, of uh, deep knowledge about the relationship with the people and they, they could make the decisions fairly for everybody. And they said this, the, the decisions that are being made are, are, are destroying our whole concept of, of, of living in harmony on the earth. And they were worried about their, their, uh, the way the medical people treat mind, treat bodies rather than mind, body and spirit together because their perception is they're inseparable. They have to treat them all uh, together. And of course, they, they, they used natural medicines, and, 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 but there was no, never any sort of, of commercial application to, to doing it. You were a healer and you treated with natural medicines. And they were disturbed about, about the, the, the companies who, who, uh, who make money out of this sort of thing. Um, they were concerned about so many things, that, that, uh, but particularly the waste, the waste of food, the waste of, of, of the earth's resources, um, just to, to produce things that nobody really needs. And they reckoned that, that if, the, if, if things go on as they are, they were deeply concerned about what was going to happen to their grandchildren, their great-grandchildren, and our great-grandchildren. And our message, it wasn't a complaining one, it was a, it was a, it was a desperation to try and understand what had happened to humans to create the world that we've created now. And when we came back, we had to. We decided we had to 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 do something about it. Try and get this message out to, to people, and, and try and lift the perception of, of of the people all around the world to the situation we're in. And this is what developed into Parallel Community. I found that uh, when I got back, I had been very very deeply disturbed by what had happened with my meeting, if you like, with the ancestors at Castle Hill. And it started a whole 
range of discussions about what, what on earth we could do about it. We were talking about it with lots of friends and we had this meeting at, at, uh, down at the Seed and a number of people, uh, different people come up every, every six weeks and we, we tune in with the earth and we, we celebrate the cycles of the earth. And this particular evening, it was pouring with rain, only five people turned up. So there were five of us at the meeting and there are frequently 20 or more. So we sat um, in a small group and uh, listened to some beautiful music. Gary Merrill was, was sitting in the back there and he suddenly looked up and he said, everybody, every human being has the right to live in peace, but we'll never get that peace until we claim the right. Hamish said he felt chills run down his spine. And I got immediately enthusiastic that, that uh, this is the message we're gonna get out. We all have the right to live in peace and why shouldn't we? And who is making the decisions that make it impossible for us to live in peace? Everything is depending upon larger and larger organisations, whether it's governments, NGOs, corporations. Um, and it's almost as though the emphasis on big setups to accomplish anything almost disempowers people. Because people feel they can't do anything themselves because the solutions are all too vast. And these people are making a decision which is based not on caring for the people around them, but for the success of their particular company. We've been, not all over the world, we've been around quite a decent part of the world. We've talked to people about this, and every one of them says, yes, we agree with you, there is a huge problem, we have to solve it, but what can I do? So how do we do anything about that? Uh, we all get together. So from there, uh, it grew, and um, more and more people wanted to know about it. And we had a meeting at Queen's Hotel Penzance. I'd say the Parallel Community is a platform for people who are no longer happy with being ignored, and that they realise that the Parallel Community is a viable modern communications platform for people who are being ignored and who want their voices heard on a number of crucially important issues where decisions are being made for them that they don't they don't care for and they never voted for. The idea of the parallel community was in a sense looking at what people can get together to do. People who um, feel isolated, who feel that they're not get getting anywhere, that they are fighting a battle on their own, not realising that there are millions of us all in the world and we just need to connect. The par parallel community is an empowerment or a voice for empowerment that says, look, you know, if, if people are voting for a massive expenditure on nuclear deterrence and things like that that uh, people may not be entirely comfortable with, then um, what do you do? Where do you go? Uh, marching, marching down Whitehall we know do no longer works. So somewhere where people actually have a platform to express their opinion in a cogent, sane, intelligent fashion. If enough people can actually do that, then, then perhaps there will be some recognition that there is a voice that needs listening to. And to show people that they're not alone, that one person working in their village or their town or their community may be doing exactly the same as another group in another village or town or community, but not knowing it. Try and get all of these people together by means of a website so they have a contact, they know, what, they know what's happening in their, their local patch, they know what's happening in the next patch. And we want to encourage some sort of community way of thinking, which says, OK, how does this... this uh, we can't sort the global problem out at the moment. How do we sort our local problem out? And if we have a local problem, is it the same as the community next door? If we have a solution to our particular problem, can we help that community? And it starts in a very small way with individual people. We see the parallel community as a network and connectors are people within that network that can connect to their local area. I don't believe we can look to any institutions to do it for us. I think we have to do it ourselves. And I also don't believe anyone has the mandate to tell anyone else what those changes ought to be, which is really quite strange. So the idea of uniting people and linking people and getting people together um, who are already trying to change their communities in whatever way it may be. We're not going to dictate, because we just do not want to be any dogma or anything like that, but people can come in with their ideas, and even if we don't kind of 
have that on our agenda, we will know where we can put that person with that idea, connect them up to somebody else so that we form like a, a connector, if you like. We don't want to be aggressive. We don't want to confront the existing situation. It's a complete waste of time. Let's, let's just set up something alongside it and say we accept what you're doing uh, and we accept that it is difficult to change the status quo but we're not going along with you. We're going over this way and we're going to bridge over what you're doing. I'm not for a second criticising anybody who actually feels they're prospering under the present system and that, that, and that everything is okay. All right, that's fine. The reason the parallel community thing actually became, or the reason for that terminology was that acknowledging that direction for a large number of people, but there's also an, a lot of people, another large number of people who, if you like, would maybe be quite happy to run alongside that not saying, you know, OK, I can't play with your colour ball because it's not working for me. So we're going to play with another colour ball and see if that works for us. Alongside each other, perfectly friendly, we respect your right to do that. It's not something we wish to get into bed with or something we feel is, is letting us down as a community. So side by side makes, makes an awful lot of sense. The parallel community's emblem is almost like a bridge going over a river that we are going to just bridge over and the rest can do what they like, but um, we will walk over the bridge and try and live and um, give an example that there is another way. I feel that politicians are doing what they can do. I, um, I don't think we want to be involved with, with politicians as such. I think somehow we need to find new structures, new ways of going on which perhaps are outside politics, they're outside religion, they're outside the institutions that we now have. So that we can find different ways of doing it to change the energy of the present systems that we're all thinking are outmoded now. It is literally impossible, I think, to be elected to that august body, Houses of Parliament, and try and change anything. It won't happen. If anyone wishes to engage in politics, however idealistic they might be to begin with, to get to the point within the political apparatus where they can actually accomplish anything, effectively they have to conform to the status quo. Um, and so the more people actually achieve positions of power, the less free they are to change anything in any fundamental way. And to that extent, I think we need to look outside politics. Um, not to go against it. Politics works only so far as people believe in it. Um, if anything, the parallel community needs to show that there are other things to believe in. What we're trying to do in, in, in parallel community is to bridge over traditional boundaries in, in every sense, in social sense, religious sense, uh, national sense, every sense, and get back to the importance of people. And also to provide, through the web, a place, a centre, if you like, where people can uh, join in or, or refer to or something. So that they have in, in the, the, the bush in Australia, if they like, they can contact this, this, the Pearl community with a problem and get some sort of answer. What we basically want to do is to, to build up a, a sound footing to, to, to uh, locally in the local community, get the expertise that we need for research and, and for uh, dealing with the, the questions and the emails from all sorts of disciplines, and have a place where people who say, what can I do about this whole situation, can come to us and say, what can I do to help? And we will start off by very, very simple things, like, like guiding them towards uh, the, their, their own community and how they can help in that. Already we have 40 connectors from all over the world, um, from Britain to Europe, Switzerland, Amsterdam, Germany, uh, to Australia, South Africa, America. It's quite remarkable. Um, you know, word of mouth only, really. One person tells another person tells another person and they are inspired to join in. I think it's helping the world, to, people to live together more um, accepting and um, appreciative of other people so that we just live in a more peaceful way. We want to become a centre of, of knowledge and, and uh, ways of, of moving our community spirit forward. The essence is to, to get people back to doing practical things. Practical things, not necessarily in the terms of, of making things, but practical 
are living with your neighbours. Not just your immediate neighbours, but your neighbours in the next country, if you like. And that takes us right through the whole religious bit and the whole political bit and, and, and things like that. Say, OK, your, religious, your religion is so-and-so, your colour is so-and-so, your country is so-and-so, but we're all people and we've forgotten how to communicate directly. How are you? Are you OK? That's all you need to do. It doesn't take any time at all. It doesn't cost you anything. But it starts building up a whole rapport with, with the community and that's what we're trying to do. Speak to people, smile more often, um, visit uh, neighbours or people in one's own village or town and just get to know people because a lot of people are extremely lonely as we've discovered. Simple things do make a difference. Once we join up and get maybe a few thousand, maybe a few hundred thousand, but we're looking actually for millions of people and we're not going to march with placards and, and things like that. We're going to quietly say to the politicians, wonderful, 10 million people would like this to happen. Listen to us. We have no desire to become a political party. Now, that's not to say that there will be political consequences if the thing actually achieves a, a certain critical mass, because inevitably, if you, if you make enough enough mass, then the politicians then have to turn around and say, well, actually, there appears to be a problem because we're not satisfying what the, uh, a, a large number of people appear to require or need. Instead of being told this and this is going to happen, it would give us a voice to discuss it. And maybe we might learn that we are wrong on some things, um, but it's the ideas of not having a voice. I think we will become a significant voice that the government will have to take notice of. Now, whether they regard it as um, a pain in their derriere is something they have to decide. I think that the more the more critical or the, the, the bigger the number, they will have to be at least aware. One thing I would love to see is people spoiling their ballots at a general election paper with a parallel community infinity logo, which really says, look, I'm not, I can't vote for any of this. How about this? Because every single ballot paper will have to be shown to every candidate on election night. Now that would be something. At least then they'd say, well, what's going on? something interesting happening here. People are getting a little disillusioned with the political system. What, what is this symbol? Why are people doing this? They will know through our web that tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, possibly millions of people are thinking this particular way. And it must influence the, the um, decision-making process. And I've got a lot of respect for parliamentary traditions, etc. They represent us. When they start to rule us, I think we have a problem. And I think we need to be aware of it. The Patriot Act in, in America, which had suddenly appeared four days after the 9-11 thing, which patently had been written a long, long time before that, was pushed through the American uh, Senate, if you like, uh, with one abstention. And the one abstention apparently was the one man who, hadn't, who, who said he hadn't read it and he couldn't, he couldn't vote for it because he hadn't read it. Apparently there were only two copies of 394 pages of this act and it was pushed through. And the Patriot Act means that I can be, if I criticise Mr Bush, which I'm not doing at the moment, if I criticise Mr Bush, I can be taken out from here and put into Guantanamo Bay or the equivalent sort of thing without any reason at all except that if I, uh, if I disagree with anything that, that the, the uh, Bush administration says, I am a terrorist or a potential terrorist. And that's what that act means. And these things are being, are being just pushed through at, at odd times. And we're having the same sort of performance happening in this country. And it's about, uh, it's about control, it's about uh, the build-up of the terrorist thing. We've had terrorists around the world for, for generations. I'm really worried about this technique of building up fear of terrorists, because one terrorist is another freedom fighter. It always has been that way. At the moment, we're a, we're a species driven by fear. We are afraid of um, war. We're afraid of not coping. We're afraid of authority. And that's increasingly the case with the, with the setup at the moment. Uh, we're afraid of not being able to pay the mortgage. We're afraid of 
not having enough money. We're afraid if we have enough money that we're going to lose it. Uh, and we live in a state of fear all the time. There are people who are, there are many, many, many people who are afraid to walk out of their houses in case they are attacked, in case they, this is not a way to live. There is no reason at all why we shouldn't live in joy. There needs to be some interference. There have to be laws, and, and yes, we, most of us are quite law-abiding, actually. But to create more and more and more and more restrictive laws that, that is, is, is just not the answer. These controls are becoming onerous. And we have to start re-establishing our, our rights and our freedom uh, and our ability to make decisions about our own lives but accept responsibility for them. We all say, yes, I'd like peace, I want to live in a peaceful world, but can we actually claim that for ourselves and be peaceful ourselves? And that's where it begins. The future for Parallel Community will lie in connecting people who are able to take various groups, individuals, small groups, bigger groups of people under the web umbrella and look at the objectives that are actually spelled out on that website. One of those is that all of us have the right actually to live in peace. What Hamish and I um, are interested in, um, which may seem a bit weird to other people, is the fact that it teaches you that nature around us is alive and we can make a difference um, by what we do and what we think and in making a difference to the world around us makes a difference to us. It's, a, it's a, a flowing from us to the earth and from the earth to us, so it's a knock-on effect. The earth responds to ritual and ceremony and attention. And that's why the ancient peoples built Stonehenge and different sacred places like that. So you can actually re-enchant old sacred places or create new ones yourself and the earth will respond to that on your estate, in your street, in your close and then in your town and out the energy goes and that really does have a profound effect. Every single thing we do, there's a reaction for every action. You become part of what you're around, you can't help that. And everything we do, everything, all of us do, is completely interconnected, negative or positive. So it might as well be positive. Doing nothing, I don't think it's really an option anymore. There is another way of living. And yes, it's, it's uh, actually, the, I had this extraordinary out of the body experience and I went up and I, I, and I met the management. I call them the management, lovely people actually. And I realized in the short time I was up there, it might be microseconds, I don't know, but there is a huge amount of humor in the universe. And the humour and the, and the laughter and the joy is being crushed out of us because you can't control people who are laughing. It's time we, we just, just shook our heads and, and got out of this and, and said, OK, what are we going to do about it? So join Parallel Community.